because I also attend a lot of meetings and I listen to a lot of speakers and the very first thing I think of is who is this guy and why should I listen to him? Well, I can't give you reasons to listen to me, but I can tell you a little bit about who I am. Um, I grew up right here. I'm from Livingston County. My family farms in Livingston County. I was educated right down the road at U of I. I'm all in on our state. This is where I want to be and you're the people I want to be working with. My wife and I are both from Illinois. This is where we want to be and this is what I want to be doing is working in the field of growers with sea people, farm management, those types of roles. So um, guys, I'm, I'm all in, I'm here. Um, I'm proud to be from the state of Illinois even if we have four former governors making our license plates. So that's kind of special. <laughs> But uh, it, it, is, uh, it is what it is. So as Sean said, he asked me to talk about soybean herbicides. Now understand, I currently work for Bayer, right? I spent 23 years with one of the major seed companies, and now I've been 10 years with Bayer. So who can name me Bayer's only soybean herbicide? Liver. Liver. That's it. That's all we got. We're all in, right? Now, I think you guys might have seen in the, in the news, we're trying to buy this little company out of St. Louis. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember the name of them. I always forget the name, but um, we're trying to buy them. That would add a little bit to our portfolio, and then we're trying to sell the Liberty thing off to another German company. So we got, we got chaos going on right now. So you might be sitting out there wondering right now, well, what's he going to say, good or bad? You don't even know what side of the fence he's on. Well, here's the story on me. I'm just going to tell you what I think. I would have told you that had we not been doing this. I'll tell you that because what I want is clean bean fields. I want to drive around the state of Illinois and see no weeds. I don't care whose who's herbicide it is. I don't really care whose beans it is. I want farmers to have good yields because the fact of the matter is, if they don't have good yields and make money, there's no money for us to get, right? <laughs> to sell anything, right? So if you keep focused on the farmer making money, I think we'll be all right. So that's, that's kind of the gist of my presentation. So I broke it down in, in, six, in six parts. Um, I want to talk to you about the number one question of 2018 that I've been getting, and I'll go through that. I want to talk about the importance of residual herbicides, and I have a little exercise I want to, I want to show you on that, because for a lot of years, we got away from residual herbicides in both corn, really, and all in beans, and I think we have to kind of sit back and remember the value uh, of those products. I want to talk about choices of residual chemistry for soybeans. I do not have a horse in that game, okay? But I have my opinions, and we'll run through that very quickly. I want to talk about why dicamba is different on soybeans than corn. And this is not a slam to dicamba at all. Dicamba's been killing weeds for 40 years. I mean, it's a great herbicide. It doesn't last in the market that long if it wasn't a good herbicide, right? But there is a difference on spraying it on corn than beans, and I think we have to be aware of that. I'm going to hit some best management practices. These will fit for both Liberty beans and Extend beans. It's overall best management practices for weed control in soybeans. And then I have just a, a, a few summary uh, comments on there. So the number one question. I, I, I've i been around Central Illinois for, like I said, a long time, 30 plus years. I know a lot of farmers. I know a lot of people. I get a lot of phone calls. The number one question that I've been, I've been receiving this year is, should I plant Liberty Link or extend soybeans? I, I get that multiple times a day, all through November, December, January, February. And so I pose the question back to them. And you guys represent both of those products in the room, right? So I'm sure you've gotten that question too. I said, what do you think? And, and right away, the farmer will jump in and say, well, I think Liberty out yields extend. Or I think extend out yields liberty. Nothing irritates me more than to hear somebody says that a trait yields. Because a trait does not yield. All right? Germplasm yields. Mr. Farmer, you need to pick the best germplasm for your farm. It's number one. I'm sad to say that even though I'm in the crop protection industry, I will tell you my products, all they do is protect your products. It, it allows them to show their best genetic yield, all right? So you guys know your trait pipelines. You know your germplasm. You need to go to that farmer with the best information for, for his farm, and you need to pick germplasm first, all right? Then we can talk about traits, because the system works, right? Either system works. The Liberty system works. We can make the dicamba system work. So traits don't yield. That's my, uh, I'm going to have that printed on bumper stickers. Um, right along with, I don't know if I shared this with you guys a year or so ago, but my wife and I have been married for 31 years now. And the only thing we fight about is she could live without meat and that's all I want to eat. And so every meal we go round and round about how much 
much meat there's going to be. So she stirs me a lot of chicken. So one day I told her, I said, honey, I love chicken. Chicken's awesome. With my steak or pork chop, chicken is one. Chicken is a vegetable. That's what you need to do. It's a vegetable. All right? And that's not a slam to chicken. I love chicken. I have chicken every meal. Right? But it's a, so I'm having chicken is a vegetable bumper sticker as many of you guys can. Nice to join my club on that. So here's some other, some other data to kind of justify this, this, this germplasm discussion that I was talking about. This actually comes from Emerson Napsiger at the U of I. It's a long-term study, and everybody knows Emerson's been at the university for a long time. But when he, this is Emerson saying this now. How many of you heard him speak? Mr. Positivity, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, jeez, come on. He's the one saying yields are no longer stagnant on soybeans. Genetics has taken us. Now, I will point out, he says genetic gain, a third of a bushel a year before 2000. He's, he's predicting two-thirds of a bushel a year after 2000. So you can kind of see where this, this line's been going. He says we're starting a new line, that, that these yields that are above this line, he's saying this. So over 1985 to 2015, at a half a bushel gain, that's this line here, we gained 16 bushel in yield. He says we're now up almost to three, and from 2011, we've gained 15 bushel in just those eight years. It just drives me crazy when a, when a farmer will say to me, oh, my corn yields have been going up, my beans haven't. What? Are you kidding me? Really? I mean, for years, what did we chase? Some of you guys got a little gray hair like I got in here. Some of you have no hair at all, right, Jeff? <laughs> yeah. All right. We chased 50 bushel beans, and we chased 200 bushel corn, right? And now you look at the percentages of what we're chasing. We're chasing a higher percentage on beans than we are on corn. Sounds like more because we want 250 on corn. That's 25 percent. But beans actually percentage-wise are higher. Germplasm is better. And I tell guys it's not a coincidence, Mr. Farmer, that when you started paying more for a bag of soybeans, your yield went up. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? This, the companies are bringing you better, better germplasm. So this gives you another reason to go to the guy and say, hey, listen, germplasm. Now, I do want to point out one thing on this as a crop protection guy. He says genetics and management. Because I think we are treating our beans differently. We're using fungicides. We're using seed treatments. We're planting earlier. We're doing some of those things. But between those two things, we're certainly making some gains on, uh, on soybean yield. So when I talk about soybeans, the very first thing I talk about is traits don't yield, plant the best germplasm, and treat them, treat them by management, and you'll see yields. You'll see higher yields, no doubt about it. So let's switch gears in and talk about the importance of residual herbicides. We've talked about this in this meeting before, but name me a couple things that makes water hemp unique. Anybody? It's got a male and female plant. Dioecious. That's the fancy word for male female. Yeah, dioecious. Write that down. That's a big word. You can impress people with that word. It's dioecious. It crosses. That means that the resistances cross to each other. That's one. What else? I heard another one over here. 100,000 uh, seeds per plant. You're wrong. That's way too low. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes a lot more seed than that. We're going to talk about that. What else? Its ability to overcome herbicide. Because it's dioecious, it crosses male. Yep, yeah, exactly. So a couple I had, one we wasn't mentioned, amount of seed production. Well, that was mentioned. It's just huge seed producing product, right? Another one is the length of emergence. And this is one I didn't cover a few years ago, but I found some studies on it and there's more work being done. This is really fuzzy and I apologize for that. But what we've got here is, this was a study from Dr. Bob Hartzler at Iowa State University back in 99, but I'm sure it holds true today. The four weeds that are on here, the blue line is velvet leaf. The yellow line is giant foxtail. Um, this is woolly cut grass, the green line, and then the red line is water hemp. So what this shows is over time, what percent of those weeds germinate. So there's a lot of weeds that come right out of the gate when the soil warms up, they all come out of the ground, then we spray them, kill them all, and no more comes, right? I wish all weeds were like that. That would be really cool, right? Um, foxtail we used to deal with. Now, I know I see some younger people in the room. I had a conversation with a young guy at a retailer the other day and I mentioned, you know, hey, we need to think about having something in there residual for grass. And he goes, grass? Grass ain't a problem. I said, 
I wish you had grown up in my era. Remember when we fought Foxtail? Everybody, uh, all the guys with gray are going there. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Um, let's not forget about Foxtail, right? Because with the seed production it can make, we always got to keep focused on that. But Roundup's the greatest grass herbicide ever invented. It's managed our seed bank. We've got a lot less pressure. Let's keep it that way. But if you look at the stink and water him, that's about as straight as a 45 degree angle line as you could possibly make. In other words, a very simple way of saying that is it just keeps coming. I mean, it doesn't come out of the ground, you kill it, and then there's no more. It just keeps coming, and that makes it a very unique animal. And then, of course, the third thing there is, is it's, it's dioecious. So how does, how does um, uh, residual herbicides play into this thing? So what you want to do is use a residual down here to hold it clean. Then when that breaks, you kill the ones that come up, and then you have another residual in there for controlling these. That is absolutely the best, the best way to do it. And so what I want to do now is I actually got challenged by a grower to say, okay, give me, give me the numbers. Give me, the, give me an example of some numbers. So I said, well, this is very simple to do. I'll make a spreadsheet. Should be pretty, pretty easy to do. All right, so I'm gonna picture a 40 acre field and we're gonna have one water hemp escape per acre, okay? So picture this 40 acre field of beans. You have one water hemp per acre. Acre's the size of a football field. Mark, you gonna be proud of that field? It's gonna look pretty clean, isn't it? 40 water hemp scattered out over 40 acres? I think it's gonna look really good. I'd be proud of that field if it's mine. I'd put a, I'd put a pro harvest sign on it. I'd be real happy, right? Let's say that every one of those water hemp makes 250,000 seeds. Now you may say, whoa, that's high. Not according to the universities. According to the universities, one all by itself out there is going to make 500,000 seeds up to maybe a million, depending on how big it gets. So I think I'm being conservative, right? Now, we know that only about 25% of those seeds that are produced are going to germinate the first year, okay? So they're not all gonna come up, right? So let's figure 25% of the water hemp germinate each year. Now, let's talk about herbicide programs. Control from the pre-emergence herbicide. Based on the rates we're currently running and the length of time those water hemp germinate, I would say 60% control is probably about what we're getting. So in other words, you're controlling 60% of them with the pre, then it breaks, then you control the rest of the 40% with the post. Everybody with me? That makes sense? Everybody kind of along, along with me here? So then you come back here to the post and I'm just gonna put 99% because you're never gonna get them all. So let's look at what this thing calculates. We have 40 water hemp, they each make 250,000 seeds, that's 10 million seeds, but only 25% of them come up, so that's two and a half million. We control 60% of this number, that leaves us a million. We control 99% of that number, we, go, we have 10,000 of them out there, that's 250 per acre. The very first year, we went from one to 250, with 60% control on the pre and 99% control on the post. All right, now you go to year two, now you got you start with those 10,000, they each make that, you've got another 25% germinating from year two, right? And you end up down here at the bottom line at 62,750. And I'm not even going to show you what's out to the right. It's <laughs> 1.9 million. Okay? This is how water hemp can take over a field. So this is the value. The point I'm trying to make to you is not to say, oh my God, water hemp's taking over the world, right? There's no way we're going to control this beast. Just sell your farm and move to Florida. I'm not saying that. We can control this, right? but we gotta be aware of the residual control. So what can we do? My, my, my thing is to run multiple modes of action and run higher rates so we get this number up to 80% instead of 60%. Now you're looking at something manageable. Now you're looking at something that we can go out there and if we need to hand pull or we need to spot spray or we need to do something, we can do it. But what's the moral, what's the total moral of this grid, right? What should have happened? Anybody tell me? How, how could we have stopped this whole thing from happening? You should have sent you all some multiple months of action before you ever got to this point. Or pull those 40 escapes. Walk out there and pull them. 
I cannot tell you how many times I've been in a pickup driving past a field and I see these five or six big water hemp and I say to the farmer, you want to go get those? And he goes, nah, it ain't hurt nothing. Half a million seeds each, I can go pull them. I'll walk out there and pull them, right? So this is the value of, of, what, uh, of what the residual herbicides bring. So, if we know the value of them, what's our choices? And I'd like to spend some time on this. Um, we basically have these choices of, I'm just going to go down through these, of uh, residual chemistry on soybeans. You have the group 2 ALS, that's things like classic and pursuit, all right? Are they going to help you with water hemp? Resistance. They're really, they're really not going to help you. Now, I have no problem with them being in the pre-chemistry because they still help with velvet leaves, giant ragweed, you know, lots of other weeds. We don't just have water hemp in the fields, and I get that. So I like that mode of action being in there, but it's not going to help you. Group 3 DNAs, truffland, cyanolan. What do us old guys call them? Yellows. Yellows. Yellow compounds. I actually had a young guy after meeting come up to me and go, I don't get why you call them yellow. Did they turn the weeds yellow or what? I'm like, no. 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 They turn your hands yellow, your shoes yellow, the equipment yellow. Slow moving, slow moving children can turn yellow. I mean, it's a, they, they were a dye is what they started out as when they started making them, and they were a very good yellow dye, right? Um, a lot of guys uh, are starting to go back to these. What's the downside of them? Got to be incorporated. And, and we plant so many of our beans no-till. We figured out years ago, our greatest resource God has given us is our topsoil. We, we don't want to lose that. I, I totally respect that. But I will say, they're very good on the amaranthus species. So you basically have, you have uh, Metribuzin, which is also sold under the brand name Sencor, correct? I have a lot of guys uh, that remind me that it's no longer Sencor. It's now all generic Metribuzin. You have the group 14 PPOs and you have the group 15 mitosis inhibitors. So it's really this three, these three groups when you're looking at water nap control that we need to pay attention to. Um, I love metribuzin. Think of metribuzin like atrazine for soybeans. We put atrazine in dang near every tank of corn chemistry and there's a reason we do that. There are a lot of triazine resistant weeds but it soups up all the other chemistry that you put it with. Metribuzin does the same thing. Keep in mind this though, there are products out there that have metribuzin on the label, but they don't have enough, all right? I think you need at least five ounces of metribuzin to get good water hemp control. So we need to calculate that out, five ounces of metribuzin. And I'll show you an example of that. The group 14 PPOs. There are people that don't like this chemistry. Why? Crop response, right? It can burn your beans, especially in cold, wet conditions. You can get that burning of the beans. And some guys have said, I got a lot of PPO resistant water hemp and it burns my beans and so I don't like it. So if you're going to throw this one out, you got two. You got metribuzin and the mitosis inhibitors. Now, when you look at the mitosis inhibitors, this is the newest thing on the market, Zidua. I like that chemistry. Active ingredient is pyroxysulfone. It is an excellent compound. It was developed by a Japanese company called Kumiai, and they've been trying to sell it to the big chemical companies in the U.S. for a long time. You can get it as Fierce, you can get it in Anthem from FMC, and you can get it in Zidua from BASF. And without telling you more, you will see it in the bear. You will see it in the bear portfolio pretty soon on corn. Okay, so it is a great compound. I would rank these exactly this way on the group 50 mitosis inhibitors for water hemp control. Zidua is by far the best product for water hemp. It is the most active on water hemp, without question. Outlook and Warrant would be next. The difference between these two, Outlook is very water soluble. In fact, it is the most water soluble herbicide on the market today. You get a three inch rain, Outlook's gone. Warrant right. too. Warrant's not as water soluble as Outlook is, but it's it's a little more water soluble than I would like it. Um, but uh, and then Dual would be by far my last, my least favorite of the mitosis inhibitors on water hemp. So then you have to look at lists like this. 
I mean, this is a whole list of pre's, and this isn't near all of them, guys. It shows the company, the components, and then what are the modes of action. Now, what I would point out, what I point out to guys all the time, is that you know you can you can take an authority elite. That's authority and dual. So you've got a 14 and a 15, right? And you can add generic metribuzin to it, right? Five ounces. So you can make these a three mode of action for fairly inexpensive, right? So any of these products, you can buy metribuzin um, separately. The one I have the, the real problem with is, is this one right here, Matador. Matador lists Sencor in there, right? It's only three ounces of Sencor at the full rate. So they're, they're, they're kind of shortchanging there a little bit. And, and I, will, I will give credit to the CPS guys. They, they have figured that out through, I think, some coaching from me. And they throw extra Syncor in there with Matador now to, to get it up to that five ounce, to that five ounce rate. So these are the choices that we have. Um, I would look at rates. I would look at, the other thing I look at is timing, right? So I looked at a lot of Liberty Fields over the last four or five years, and I'd walk out and look at a field of Liberty Beans, and the beans would be this tall, and the water hemp would be that tall. Right away, that makes me question things, right? I say, did you, did you use a pre-emergence residual product? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Authority Elite, whatever, he'll name it, right? Usually the right rate. When would you put it on? Oh, we had a good week there, the, you know, last week in March, first week in April. Put that on. When did you plant your beans? Oh, about May 20. Well, you just provided great weed control for seven weeks when you had no beans on it, right? And then it broke and your beans came up. So your field looked really good while you had no crop. That's awesome, right? Now what are we gonna do, right? So my point is timing. Not only using these products, but using tillage or burn down to keep it clean and then getting these residual products on right at planting, right after planting, right ahead of planting, because you want them to be working as those beans are coming up. Remember back to that line on water hemp, right? We gotta provide that residual control and then kill the ones when they break and then provide more residual control with the post. And these are the choices that we have today. Now, there will be a new mode of action coming out on the market, and I think Randy, you're talking about this next, but balanced GT beans will bring a, a new mode of action to pre-emergence on soybeans. So then we'll have the opportunity to use the group 27s. So right up here, you don't see any group 27s. That would be things like, you know, balance and lotus and Callisto and things like that. Great, great chemistry. So that will add a new mode of action um, to those. Any questions about any of this? I think I saw a couple of hands maybe. Going with Sean. So of these products here, if we have growers that are looking to know they we got the extend beans. Mm -hmm. They're going to use mm -hmm. that canva in a burn down situation to throw water hemp or mayor's mm -hmm. tail. Mm -hmm. Are there any better or as tank mix partners? How did that mean? So the question I would have, if you were a farmer calling me with that question, when are you going to do that burn down? If you have not put anything on for winter annuals and your field is covered in chickweed and henbit in March, like coming up here real soon, I got guys that say, well, I'm going out there now. I want to put my residual on with my burn down. Well, I got two problems with that. Number one, it's way too early, as we, as we already discussed. And number two, I believe a lot of that chemistry, if the field is really thick with henbit and chickweed, will get tied up in that mat of dying, dying in a weed mat. And it's not going to be as available. So that, now I'm saying, Mr. Farmer, you need to go kill that with a burn down, then come back with your pre right ahead of planting. It's another, it's another pass. Or, or, here's a salesman in me coming out, use something in the fall like Autumn Super so you don't have the chickweed and the hen bit out there, right? So control them in the fall when they're young, actively growing weeds. But my, my favorite, quite honestly, I love the residual chemistry. Uh, I love Syncor with it. Syncor is always good, Metribuzin. And then whether the guy's uh, happy or not with products like Valor or Authority, um, I, I have no problem with the Group 14 PPOs. But, but there's just some people that are risk averse and don't want that opportunity to burn the beans. So then they, they really just have those two choices, run good rates and get it on close to planning. So, so what is the rate of Zidua Pro? Um, you know what? I'd have to look it up. I can't keep all the rates, all the rates straight. I know Zidua by itself is a very low use rate product. It's in the ounces, two ounces, two ounces thereabouts, um, which is which is a very handy product to use. Zidua Pro would contain uh, 
uh, Sharpen, which is also a low use rate product. Zidjo is low use rate. This would be the highest pursuit, would be the highest use rate thing in the mix. I'll never forget a few years back, my brother-in-law, who is the farmer in our family, called me and I had been telling him for two years, you need to go back to a pre on your beans. You need to make that pass, because he'd been told post roundup. Right, and finally one year things just got a lot away on some farms, and he called me and he says, "Okay, I get it, I get it, I got, I got to do this." He goes, "What are my choices?" Well, at that time I talked to him about Boundary, and he goes, "Boundary, you never heard of it? What's in it?" I said, "Dual and Syncor." And he goes, "Holy, that, that's old stuff. I mean, where's the new stuff?" I said, "What do you mean, where's the new stuff? How how many years has it been since you bought into this stuff?" I don't know, twenty years. Well, there you go. That's why there's no new stuff, right? We didn't think we'd ever need it. We didn't think there'd ever be a market for it. We thought it was going to be a roundup world forever. Down here, I wanted to mention post tank mix partners. With either, and, and again, you'd have to check the extended max label, whether these things are cleared. But uh, my personal favorites for, you can go back to the Zidua's. You can uh, uh, Warrant, Warrant Ultra. These would be Acetaclor products. Um, Outlook, if, if the forecast is for dry weather, you know, I'm going to spray my beans and, and the long-term forecast is dry, 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 I try to go Outlook. Again, because it's so water-soluble, it takes less moisture to activate that active ingredient. Dimethamid would be the best product to use. If it's going to be wet, I'd go to something like, like Zidua. Now, whether we can move that quickly, knowing what the forecast is, but these are really the only, the only products you have um, post. All of them can go with Liberty. I'd have to check the Extendamax website to what, see what's what the um, height restriction on Zidua post. It can't go on R1. too big. I'm, I'm assuming it's, it's R1 or close to it. But is it the Zidua Pro you don't want to post? Right. It'd be Zidua okay. alone. I don't have Zidua, Zidua Pro by here. itself is Zidua. okay for post. Yes. Yeah. Again. I can't go through the label on every one of these products. I'm talking about generalities of chemistry, so we'd have to, once you make your plan, know what your timings are. But, uh, but and, and you want to go early, guys. You don't, you don't want to wait. I mean, three-inch weeds, and, and I'll, I'll get to that in the, in, the, uh, in the next section. Let's talk a little bit about why dicamba is different on soybeans and corn. And I'm going to get kind of in the weeds here. Get, get the joke. Get in the weeds here a little bit. Um, Dicamba basis for selectivity. This is the weeds I was talking about. You know, we don't really think about how did we make this? How did this occur? How did they, how did, I think this is cool. Now I'm a weed nerd, so maybe you guys won't think it's cool, but I think it is. We gotta remember that herbicides must be metabolized the plant to reduce possible negative effects on the, on the growth. It does that by affecting enzymes. So you've got to spray the herbicide, it's got to get in the plant to do what it needs to do to kill the wheat, right? We all know that. There's a soil bacterium, Pseudomonas multophilia, it's a certain strain of that, that converts dicamba to another acid, this acid right here. That acid is absorbed to the soil much more strongly than dicamba, but right here's the key, it lacks herbicidal activity. These enzymes responsible for this first breakdown is a three component system called dicamba, or they just call it DMO gene. So Monsanto isolated this enzyme in this DMO gene, they put it in cotton, they put it in soybeans, and now the soybeans are resistant to the dicamba, right? That's pretty cool. They took a soil bacteria that breaks down dicamba, put it in there and made it work. Not a whole lot different than how BT corn came about, right? We took Bacillus thuringiensis out of the soil and, we put, and they put it in every cell of the corn plant. So it's something very, very similar. But think about where this is at in the soil, okay? Now, let's talk about random facts about herbicides. Foliar applied systemic herbicides must enter through the cuticle and translocate to the site of action. We talked about that earlier. You gotta make it stick to the leaf, you gotta make it get in the weed so it can get in there and do its job to kill the weed, right? Okay? This herbicide loading occurs passively via distribution, diffusion through the cuticle and cell walls through osmosis. So that little drop of water lands on the leaf and it sits there. There's more concentrated of the herbicide in the drop than in the leaf. So it's got the right adjuvants in it and it starts diffusing through the cuticle into the leaf, right? And it'll start to even itself out through osmosis, right? 
Not all of it will go in the leaf because some stays in the water, but we got to get enough in the plant to do the job. Higher humidity reduces that speed of evaporation. So if it's cool and wet, that drop's going to sit there for a long, long time, right? And that, that evenness between what's in the plant and what's in the droplet takes a long time to do. But there can be a lot of other things that affect the product that's in that droplet while it's sitting there as well, right? Higher temperatures increase the speed of evaporation. If it's hot and dry, that droplet's going to evaporate. You're not going to get as much in the plant. You're going to have more on the leaf surface. Right? So either way, whether it's real humid or whether it's real dry, you could have the potential to have a lot of that herbicide left on the leaf surface because of that diffusion of how it gets in the leaf. Does that make sense? Okay? If you guys are all with me. Time influences the interactions with the elements in the environment. Dew is not purified water. That is not RO water that's on that leaf, meaning there's other things in the environment that can infect that, affect that herbicide, and leaf surfaces are not sterile environments. Now, let's see if we can put this all together. When dicamba hits the soil, it's broken down and absorbed as a non-herbicidal product. Remember, we talked about that. Doesn't hit the weed, doesn't hit the crop, hits the soil, gets converted pretty quickly, it's non-herbicidal. When dicamba sits on a leaf in the environment, it's more likely to be affected by other things in the environment. Now, that's the difference between how much is hitting the soil here in this corn and how much is hitting the soil in that bean crop. Right? You have a lot more dicamba sitting on that leaf tissue that can be affected by the environment. It's not converted to a non-herbicidal product. Now, Again, I'm not bad-mouthing dicamba. I'm saying these are the things we need to understand and think about. That's why we're seeing these things. A lot of other people will talk to you about, well, it's higher humidity, higher wind in June when you're spraying it, and back when we're spraying corn, you got more trees flowering, you got more pumpkins growing, you know, whatever, tomato plant. I think this is the biggest issue right here. All that product sitting on those leaves can be affected by the environment, whether it's too wet, whether it's too dry, what have you. But not all of it's going to go in that plant. Now, you may hear other speakers from the companies that make these products, and they'll say, oh, once it dries on the leaf, it, 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 it doesn't go anywhere. I'm calling BS on that, boys. That's just not right, right? Gray group stuff, but we need to think about it. Now, a lot of these rules were developed for Extended Max because of that, and I have this sheet. I don't know if you guys are planning on passing these out. That's fine. Okay. Um, this, I think, is a great sheet that they put together, and it basically lists all the rules for Extendamax. Now, I'm going to tell you guys something. There is a new law in the books called the Endangered Species Act. It's a new government act. And what you're now going to see in the coming years is not only will these dicamba products have rules like this, all the herbicides are going to have to be re-registered, and you're going to see buffers on every herbicide. You're going to see don't spray on certain slopes on every herbicide. Every herbicide is going to have to go through this unless we get Trump to repeal this Endangered Species Act. So if you think this is the only herbicide that's going to be managed like this, right now it's, we're going to have some rules and regulations on every product. Even the old stuff is going to have to be re-registered. So you got things like you got to go through a mandatory training, 22 ounce use rate, 3 to 10 mile an hour. Not lower, not higher, that's the only range. Only use the approved nozzles. Do not exceed 15 mile an hour spraying. Cleaning equipment, boom height max of 24 inches. Approved tank mixes only. Minimum 15 gallons per acre. Absolutely no AMS. Did you guys know that these products in the jug, like this product right in this jug right here, it's an inert product. It's not a herbicide. It won't kill a weed. There has to be some salt cleaved off that product before it becomes a herbicide. It has to be converted in the environment. So that's what this AMS does is it cleaves that salt off too quickly and makes it too volatile because it changes the chemical formulation of the herbicide. Only spray sunrise to sunset. You need a 110 foot buffer. Do not apply when wind is towards susceptible crops. And this is the key one, boys. What time did you start spraying? What time did you quit? What was the wind? What direction was the wind? Uh, two years records kept. And there's actual sheets on these websites to go to, and they want it on those sheets. And you have to have your record that you passed the class attached to that sheet if anybody ever asked for it. 
So get ready. All this stuff is uh, is coming. And my rules on this is obey obey the rules on this. Follow them. People are going to be watching. And we do not. I'm going to say this again. We do not want to lose the registration of these products. Because what else do you think will happen? We'll lose it to corn. Right? We will lose dicamba and corn. And we got uh, 27 resistant weeds in Illinois. Dr. Hager told me the other day on the phone there's going to be four more added to that. So we'll have 31. We'll be leading the nation because the land of fruits and nuts out here has 30. <laughs> you guys can take that however you want. I meant like oranges. <laughs> okay. So we have an issue. We don't need to lose tools, right? We don't need to lose active ingredients. We need more of them, right? So that's my, my point of, uh, of stewarding that. So let's sum all this up with some best management practices. And what I'm talking about now is both liberty and extend. It doesn't matter, right? This is best management practices for herbicides and soybeans. Start with clean fields, either tillage or burn down. And I made myself a note up here. Vertical tillage is not weed control. Now, I'm not bad enough in vertical tillage. I get, I get vertical tillage, and I get the benefits of vertical tillage, and I'm all in. Just understand it doesn't kill weeds, right? Kind of makes them mad, actually. So I think what it does makes them harder to kill later on. Apply residual herbicides with multiple sites of action on the driver weeds. We've talked about that. Your group 15 mitosis inhibitors. Get that five ounces of metribuzin in there and get it on close to planting. After you planted, then scout that field 14 to 21 days after the crop emergence. Apply post chemistries when emerging weeds are less than three inches. How fast can a water hemp grow? Fast. Inch a day, at least, good conditions, maybe faster. So I'm not sure this 14 to 21 days. I mean, I think we need to be out there a lot. Then scout five to seven days after that post application. If necessary, apply a second post application or alternate method. I like the way they worded this. Alternate method. What do you think that means? <laughs> huh? Ho would be one. That would be <laughs> definitely be my alternate method. I know that. Ho, cultivator, things like that. If a second post application is made, again, five to seven days. Scouting that five to seven days after you spray. And then remove any and all weed escapes before viable seed is, is produced. So uh, we need to be out there a, a whole lot more. I got a question on that last one. Yeah. When is that? I mean, you got them weeds in the 40 acres. I got a question on that, too. You got one weed per acre in 40 acres? Yeah. How many of those are male, and, and do the males produce seed? Yeah, the males do. The males do not produce seed. They produce uh, the females produce pollen. The males produce no, the other way. Females produce seed. Well, I'm having a hard time with that, ain't I? Um, females produce seed. It's it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell when you're out there. I just tell guys if you have a population, assume they're all females, and assume they're gonna make seed. I mean, not. I don't want to be the guy to go in your field and count how many males there are and how many females are out there. Right? So we got to kill them all. So, and when is the seed viable? Like on the about nine days after pollination. So once you see the seed on that plant, it's viable. Yeah. So, so you once they've already got the big seed heads out there, and you cut it off and throw it on the ground, a bunch of them will grow. In fact, I we did this at our research station up at Kankakee with with uh, Palmer amaranth. We cut them off and laid them on the ground, and they'll actually do like corn, where they'll grow roots out of the nodes and grow down in the ground and keep going, just like when you see corn gooseneck and it shoots the roots out of the out of the nodes. And something else. In water hemp will germinate all season long, which is unusual also, Kurt. Showed that on the chart, yeah, it just keeps coming. I've seen little water hemp germinate in August that only get this tall and get a seed head on. 19 days from germination to where it's fully reproductive. Yeah, something like that. It's just crazy. Uh, what, we talked about all the nasty things with water hemp. What I didn't mention is what's its weakness? All around. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that joke before, and I still think it's funny. <laughs> Palmer Amaranth will choke it out. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah. How uh, was your field? You wouldn't be laughing. I'll give it to you. Um, Diesel fuel on the mat. <laughs> um, 
Its, weak, its weakness, if it has one, is the length of time it can live in the soil, the seed. You know, when, when I was out there as a kid pulling uh, but, butter prints and cockleburrs, that seed was probably produced when my grandpa was farming the farm, right? It'll live in the soil 40, 50 years, water him five years. So if we can eliminate it from a farm for five years by hand weeding, cultivating, alternative, I like the alternative methods up here, you can severely reduce the populations. Um, summary comments. Guys, follow label and the rules on extend. Everyone's watching this thing. Everyone's watching it. Um, weed resistance is a reality that will exist for as long as we farm. We don't need to lose one of our tools. All existing sites of action have some level of resistance in the row crop weed population. All but liberty. It's the exception, but for how long? There is no silver bullet on the horizon. Millions of dollars are required to discover and develop the next herbicide site of action. Even more investment in time and dollars are required to develop a trait to align with most compounds of herbicidal selectivity. That's why I'm told we're buying that little company I can't remember out of St. Louis is to match the time from when the herbicide is discovered to when the trait is started to be developed against that herbicide. Uh, I'm told that Bayer finds herbicides all the time that work great on weeds. Work great. Great residual, great burn down, great for the environment, doesn't kill the horned toads in some remote valley in Utah. Great products, right? Fortunately, they also kill corn, soybeans, cotton, wheat, and alfalfa. So the traits are, traits are the future. The era of total post weed control is over. We talked about the value of residuals. And then soil residuals hold the keys to slowing or stopping weed resistance in the cropping system. So you can follow me on Twitter at Eric underscore if. There's my email address. I have a few of these posters.